Hello, my name is Alistair Jukes. I'm an adult and paediatric neurosurgeon here in Adelaide. Um, I grew up in Sydney. Um, I did part of my training here in Adelaide, part in Sydney, and then did fellowship over in Canada. And I've just recently returned here. Um, and this is the place I did my PhD during my training, funded by the NRF. What first got you interested in medicine? Uh, well, I was actually a relatively late interest in medicine, um, so I didn't want to do it in school. I wanted to actually be a pilot, so I was doing my pilot's licence, but to fund that I was working in a pharmacy. I noticed that people would come in and they just talk to you about their you know, concerns, things they'd never tell other people, and it was just a fascinating way of gaining trust with people. I thought I'd love to do this as a career because you just have this direct impact day to day on people just by making relatively small changes. So that was probably the start. And did you, always, did you always know that you wanted to be a neurosurgeon? Uh, no, actually. Um, again, that came to me when I was working as the intern at the Royal Adelaide Hospital um, and just did a rotation in it. So I had interest, but um, no, I was originally thinking I wanted to be a physician, then I did it, and then, you know, um, but definitely neurosurgery was, a, again, a late comer to it. How many years did it take to train to become a neurosurgeon? So it's at least seven years training within the training scheme, so I did a year of PhD as part of that. Um, and then two years of fellowship as well. So around 10 to 12 would be the average. And did you have any standout teachers or mentors along the way? Uh, yes, actually. So I've had a couple here in Adelaide. So Cindy Malloy has been a standout teacher for me, especially in the paediatric realm. Um, Steve Santorinios over at the Royal Adelaide, um, again, for doing skull base. And then Sydney Rodney Allen, who's a vascular neurosurgeon over there. Um, so I ended up doing the same fellowship as him in Canada. But there's been several, and I think that's the, the beauty of neurosurgery is we work so closely with mentors and consultants that you've then got that opportunity to model your practice on people you admire, and I really enjoy that. You mentioned that you did a fellowship in Canada, so what was that experience like working overseas? That was fantastic, actually. I love that. I would have go back again in a heartbeat just for the fun. But um, the town itself was lovely, uh, the people lovely, and it's really nice to focus on a subspecialty that you're really interested in. You, know, you can really just focus on getting good at, at one or two things. Um, and interesting, this is quite good because it's a crossover between neurology, radiology and neurosurgery, doing endovascular neurosurgery, so clot retrievals for strokes, coiling of aneurysms, that kind of thing. So historically, that's not really been a neurosurgical specialty, so it's been quite fun to do something that essentially we, we really don't practice here that much, or at least haven't up to this point um, from the neurosurgery side. And where do you currently operate? Here in Adelaide? Uh, so I'm um, at the three public hospitals, so Royal Adelaide, Flinders and the Women's and Children's, um, and then also at Memorial Hospital as well. What's the most hours you've worked in one week? Uh, it'd be over 100. Um, neurosurgery is pretty classic for long hours. Um, it depends on the job you're doing at the time, but I suspect it would be well over 100. The longest you've been without sleep? Again, uh, maybe 30. 30 something hours, um, you know, doing an overnight on call and then operating the next day, something along those, those lines. What was your first surgery on a real patient? Uh, it was a chronic subdural at the old Royal Adelaide Hospital many, many years ago. Um, it was actually in the middle of the night as well, so, but vividly remember, I think everyone remembers their first operation, so that one is burned in the memory. Do you remember your first surgery as the lead surgeon? It's actually that same, oh, one, it was? same <laughs> operation. Yeah. What's the longest surgery you've ever performed? Uh, Probably a bypass, high flow bypass, which would go for about 18, 19 odd hours, uh, something along those lines. Took breaks in the middle, but around that. What's the most surgeries you've performed in one day? Uh, probably seven or eight. Again, neurosurgery tends to be, we don't do things like colonoscopies that are 30 minutes or so, so the majority of them are fairly long, but probably six or seven. Uh, what's the most common surgery you perform? Uh, luckily for me, I'm more cranial, so probably brain tumours. Um, trauma, that kind of thing. Um, but I think for most neurosurgeons, it's actually probably spine, um, but I'm much more a cranial neurosurgeon. So. And what's the most complex surgery you've ever performed? Uh, again, um, high flow bypass. So a, a child with a dissecting vertebro basilar aneurysm and then essentially taking blood vessels from the leg and then putting them from the outside of the brain to the inside of the brain and then reversing flow back down that aneurysm, which is kind of cool. What is a day in your life as a neurosurgeon like? Uh, well, fun mainly. Uh, depends on what day it is, um, but generally it's a ward round around seven o'clock um, and then operating from around eight till five or eight till six, uh, and then around after that in the evening. Um, and obviously throughout that, there's also clinics, communicating with registrars, that kind of thing. 
um, and they're not on call as well. So if, say, there's a night that you're on call, you might have to operate or go in and see patients, that kind of thing. Um, ultimately, after hours is, is generally more registrar-led, um, but we're still obviously involved with that as well. So it's very variable, and I kind of like that as well. It's not that nine to five, sit in front of a spreadsheet all day. And do you have a particular neurosurgical specialty? Uh, yeah, so my fellowship's in neurovascular surgery, so open and endovascular, so things like aneurysms, AVMs, um, fistulas, that kind of thing, um, and that's doing that through craniotomies in the skull, but also going up through blood vessels and putting in coils or stents, flow diverters, that kind of thing as well, um, and retrieving clots in, say, stroke. And what are some of the things you enjoy most about being a neurosurgeon? I actually really enjoy the team approach. Um, I know neurosurgery historically has obviously been a bit of a lone wolf specialty and we're very separate from a lot of other surgical departments because obviously the head is it's just us. But I actually really enjoy working with the craniofacial team over in the paediatric setting. Um, they're a great bunch of you know guys and girls, we really get on well. And I think you learn hugely, no matter how far along you are, you learn from other specialties. Different ways of closing wounds, different ways of thinking about a problem. I love that the most actually. I think operating with other teams is just fantastic. And what are some of the more challenging aspects of neurosurgery? Well, I think ultimately in neurosurgery, there's a lot of it is about people's brains and that's their personality, you know, how they interact with the world. Um, and whether it's the disease process such as the cancer that's starting to rob someone of their function or their faculties, or sometimes the sad thing of telling someone that's what's likely in your future um, and whether we can do something about it or not, that's a very sad thing. Um, but I think that's something that you have to manage and manage your own emotions around that. Um, the other thing is talking to patients. So a lot of things happen in neurosurgery, say trauma, um, where it's a very sudden impact on a person, telling someone that they are their family member's going to die or that we have a brain death situation, that kind of thing. And I think, again, that's a very sad thing that a lot of other specialties don't necessarily deal with as much as we do. And can you describe your approach when you first meet a new patient? Yeah. Developing that relationship? Certainly. <laughs> um, I think ultimately it's to work out where they're coming from as a person. So really determining what their level of knowledge is about their situation. A lot of people may have been referred in by a general practitioner and they've really been given no information. Um, and Or some people come in and they've researched and Googled from top to bottom and I think it's important to work out where they are, what they're coming from and what they're bringing to the table. Also important to work out what their goals are because a lot of neurosurgery is, is not necessarily about curing someone, it's about ameliorating symptoms and giving them the best chance of a good functional outcome. And you've really got to work that out on a person by person basis. What's acceptable to them in terms of a, a deficit, say if you were trying to remove a lot of a brain tumour, and what it is that they'll prepare to live with afterwards and what that trade off and balance is. And I think really that's that open communication straight up front, not you know using words that might be not really, the patient's understanding may not be there. So it's basically just having that upfront communication. And I'm very honest with people and I think they appreciate that. Um, what advice would you give someone who was interested in pursuing a medical career and particularly neurosurgery? I would definitely do it. I would do it again. I know a lot of people have, you know, if you talk to them in the cafe, they might be like, oh, I don't think I want to do this, but I've loved every minute of it. And there are some frustrating parts. And I think a lot of that is frustration that you get in any career or any administrative system that works around it. But the actual subject matter of neurosurgery itself or medicine itself, it's fantastic. And you get to go home and you can directly point to where you've impacted people's lives in a positive way. That's fantastic. And I don't take anything away from careers. My entire family are accountants and I totally don't take anything away from that. But I like the fact there are tangible, there's names to faces that I've helped here. And that's what makes it worthwhile for me. So definitely do it. You also have an interest in neurosurgical research. What made you want to pursue research in addition to surgery? I think with surgery, you help one person at a time. And with research, you've got this potential to have a much broader impact, whether that's public health, whether that's designing, say, a new technology, or whether that's working on a new way of doing something. You've just got this ability to impact people you've never met. And that's the beauty of research, especially well-conducted research. Whereas, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing surgery, but it's one person at a time. And I think you feel like you can have a bigger impact by research. How has the NRF supported you as an academic neurosurgeon? So I did my PhD with the NRF uh, back five, six years ago now, um, and they supported me very well with funding and also with advice, because I think it can be quite daunting when you don't come from a research background to take on something like a PhD. And obviously you've got good mentors, but having the NRF there as a good support structure around the outside, as well as a funding source has been fantastic, because there's people who've been through everything before, and when you feel like you're approaching a problem, there's always that tendency to think you're the only person that's ever happened to, but the NRF has just been a fantastic support in terms of funding, in terms of advice, mentorship, um, and also knowing that you've got a good focus of where you're going and how that research can be applied. 
So August is Neurosurgery Awareness Month. Are there any aspects of neurosurgery that you wish there was more awareness around? Yeah, it's actually yeah, something that's neurosurgery and neurology, but um, stroke and vascular problems are quite important because we've got the ability to intervene to the point of taking out blood clots when people have um, you know, a stroke. And I think getting to hospital early, seeing a doctor, getting a CT scan and working out whether you're eligible to have that happen or not, it's a very time critical thing because the brain doesn't really have a supply of oxygen hanging around to just use. So as soon as you get a clot there and a blockage, the brain starts to die, so minutes count. And I think ultimately raising awareness of that and getting to hospital early if there are symptoms would be a fantastic thing and probably make far more people eligible for treatment. And what sort of things should people be looking out for? So things like weakness on one side, so if they say a facial droop or there's weakness on one arm, one leg, trouble talking, um, slurred speech, that kind of thing. And especially if they wake up with those symptoms, um, it's getting to hospital quite quickly and not waiting to see if they develop. Worst case scenario, you get a scan and it's normal, but no one's going to laugh at you. But I think it's better than the alternative of sitting at home and waiting to see if it gets better. What do you enjoy doing in your spare time? What are you passionate about outside of work? So, I, as I said, I wanted to be a pilot previously, so I like flying, although I haven't really been doing that since I came back from Canada because I'm still trying to organise my life. Um, but flying and photography as well. So. Do you have a quirky or interesting fact about the brain or neurosurgery? I'm not sure if it's necessarily quirky, but something that I've found fascinating is how much of the brain is actually quiescent or doesn't really do all that much. It always amazes me how much of the brain that you can operate on and someone wakes up and they're completely normal and talking to you and it's like you never did anything to them except they've got a cut on their head. And it's just fascinating how the brain sort of structures that so that some parts are incredibly important and they're only a millimetre you know, square and other parts are absolutely massive and yet there's really no functional difference and it's just fascinating to me about that.